Hello FX fans, it's coming to the end of the year and what a year it's been. In this month's flight deck, I thought I'd count down some of the highlights from the past year. At January, of course, we announced our 2023 range. And you guessed it, we'll see you in January 2024 for another range launch. Here's some of our highlights from the range we shared at the time. At the end of January, we announced our brand new tea and coffee range. Did you get any? Let me know in the comments down below. And in February, we gave you a little peek behind the curtain and a tour of the factory making our 124th scale Spitfire. So we start off here with the, the box and actually the box is very important because underneath you have the Airfix logo uh, and the Airfix logo goes on the bottom. So the first thing you have to do is fold the box the right way around. So that's the first most important job. Fold the box the right way around, get the Airfix logo where it should be and then you get your stickers. So these are our high quality stickers from Italy and you get this piece of card here. And you pull that one out, so let's take a new one. So you get your stickers, look at those lovely stickers. And they will go in the box and they go at the bottom so they stay flat. And then you put your little bit of paper over the top to protect the top of it. The next thing that happens is you get your instructions here now we've already put these together so you get your instructions but after the first page you've got your leaflets here showing you what to do with your paint and you've got the three different versions as you can see there so they all sit inside the first page so when the customer opens it he's not going to go where are they they're there, they're ready for him. And that will sit on top of the stickers, again, protecting the stickers, keeps them nice and flat. And as we come along, we've got this carpet on here and the carpet is to protect the box because we even want the box to turn up nice and white with the Airfix boss on the bottom, very clear. And then what we do is we get the product. Now this one hasn't got a bag on it, but it will do because this is the last tool that's running and they will go in there. So let's just skip a couple of stages. So there'll be the next one. This will be the next one. And this one's in the bag now. So it's all sealed, quality signed off. And they'll go in and as you move along, the same principle would apply. Then you get to this one, which is the cockpit. This is the clear one. This is the one that you can see through. That will then go in and you keep going. Now, when you get to here, these are the bigger components. These are the wings. The wings would go in, and this is where you use, rather than the bags to protect them, this is just a bit of recycled card. So that sits on there, and that will stop them scratching. So when I take the next one, that will sit on top and won't scratch. And then I take my next one, and so on. And you carry on, do the next one and then you turn around and give it to packing. Packing will then take one of these 
Lovely boxes with the artwork showing the product in a live shot. They would then pack that over the top and then it finally would go in an outer box. So it gives it that protection because a lot of people would like their box with the Spitfire to turn up without damage. So you put it in an outer like that that then allows it to ship safely. And a lot of people don't realize this, but actually the outer box in shipping, if it gets damaged, isn't a problem. That it's designed to take the impact. So actually the bit that should arrive intact is the, the, bro the box here, which has got the, uh, the product inside it. This is the one. So that should turn up without any nicks and damages. But this one here can get damaged as much as it likes really. This is the protective piece. This is doing all the work. So that's how it gets packed. And then also what's not shown there is the security stickers. So actually at the bottom of the product, you'll get two half moon shapes when it goes together, one on each side that should show that it's actually been packed and not been tampered with. So they're tamper proof stickers. So you get a half moon on each one and they would be right at the very bottom so you know it hasn't been tampered with. So typically we won't know until we run it, but we've got, as I say, the one last tool. And when that's over here, that will be down here. And there's another box here that's not there at the moment because we're setting the line up. But say that other box was there, you'd have somebody here who's making up the boxes and also packing them at the end. So they'll work across there. And then you'll probably have two people, one that will probably work up to here and then one that will work that station there. So there'll probably be three people in the cell. And then when they're palleted, they'll either go down that side into storage or down this side into storage. And then they'll go straight on the lorry because the loading bay's there. So it's all, all very carefully planned together so we can get it out the door and it has a nice flow to it especially with the, the machine that provides most of the product being adjacent to the assembly line, which will definitely be the case in the last one because as they come off, we'll be using those parts live. They'll be coming straight to the line. So that's how we'll do that. Of course, this year was the Dan Buster's 80th anniversary and to commemorate the Dan Busters, we released our first coin of the year in March. March also marked Women's History Month, and here at Airfix, we have the privilege of speaking to some very talented women within the aviation community. If you're interested in reading any interviews with these women, there'll be a link in the description below. Established shortly before the Second World War, the WAAF was a reaction to a potential war in Europe. Conscription was introduced from December 1941, and by July 1943, 182,000 women were part of the WAAF ranks. The one job women couldn't do in the WAF was fly. However, the necessity for more pilots led to the formation of the Air Transport Auxiliary. The ATA ferried new, repaired and damaged military aircraft between factories, assembly plants and even active service squadrons and airfields. The ATA allowed women pilots to ferry the aircraft. The female pilots were nicknamed Attergirls, and over the war there were 166 women pilots, and one in eight of all ATA pilots. One of the most notable features of the ATA was that women received the same pay as men of equal rank, starting in 1943. This was the first time that the British government had agreed to equal pay for equal work within an organisation under its control. Over a quarter of a million women served in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, 183,317 were volunteers, with 33,932 women conscripted. The majority were aged between 18 and 40. The contribution made by the WAAF to the war effort cannot be overstated, and it is a testament to the courage, determination and resilience of the women who served.
End of March also saw the first episode of our retro unboxing series. We're always keen to know what you'd like to see, so if there's a kit we haven't got to yet and you'd like to see it, comment down below and we may be able to find it in our archive. The box type we have in front of us today was released 35 years ago in 1988. This box has been collecting dust in someone's attic for those 35 years, but the parts are in great condition. All 23 of them in fact. Yes, that's right, this kit has only 23 parts. The 23 parts are spread across three frames and are interestingly moulded in this silver type plastic. What do you think about these coloured sprues? Do you think Airfix should bring them back? The rivets are quite raised and largely defined. You'll also notice that the sprues on the tree type sprue that you'd have seen at the time are more recently in Airfix starter sets. This did mean we had to play a game of Airfix Operation when we pulled this out of the box, as age hasn't been kind to the smaller parts hanging on the sprue, they've become rather flimsy. The scheme on this boxing is number 6 Air Experience Flight from RAF Abingdon, Oxon 1987. So if you were doing your flight training around the Oxford area in the late 80s, it's not impossible that you took your training on this very plane. As you may find with some of the older Airfix kits that have been time capsuled in your loft, the decals have started to yellow. However, they're still in great condition and who's to say they didn't run out of white paint at RAF Abingdon. Let's take a look at the instructions. There's a lot going on here, but only five steps, so it has to be simple enough, right? Although I do have to say I prefer the modern day ones, they're a lot easier to understand. Well that's the de Havilland DHC1 Chipmunk from 1969. What kit should we take off the shelf next time? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. April saw the release of one of my favourite kits of the year, the 617 Squadron Dan Buster's 80th Anniversary Gift Set. And now for my highlight of the year, in May I had the privilege of visiting the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre and I got up close with a Lancaster. Yesterday we were lucky enough to see a taxi run and today we're here with flight specialist Michael Clegg who's going to talk to us about all things Lancaster and all things Dambusters. Let's get into it. If the men of RAF number 617 squadron were going to be successful in the dam busting raid on the evening of the 16th and 17th of May 1943, they were going to be needing something like this. For the dam busters raid they were going to need a very um, specialist aircraft that was going to have to be modified for the task because the, uh, the upkeep mine was, was a, a unique and um, you know, recently invented um, weapon. Uh, the only the only aircraft that was capable of doing that was the Lancaster. It was um, the huge bomb bay and the fact that it was our premier um, bomber at the time meant that it was, it was the only one really that, that could be uh, adapted for the job. So they took, um, they took 23, I think in total, um, uh, Lancasters from the Lancaster production line and they modified them to um, 464 provisioning standard, which meant the removal of the, of the huge bomb bays and the installation of the, uh, of the the mechanism that we're going to carry the mine. Um, obviously, they had to make it aerodynamic as well, so they, they, they're a little bit of fairing. But that was uh, it was so they were basically standard Lancasters. Now, the one that you can see behind us is a later variant of the Lancaster, so it's got uh, it's got modified um, modified turret, modified weapons on the rear and the and the front turret, and the turret position is actually different to, to the ones that would be on the on the B3 special which is what uh, was used for the dam busters raid but as I say there were actually only 23 of those in existence and only 19 of them uh, flew on the raid um, a couple were used for sort of prototyping uh, purposes and uh, one was damaged during the training with another unserviceable just before the raid so the, the main reason that made the Lancaster such a successful aeroplane is this huge 
unobstructed bomb bay. Um, as you can see, there's no, um, there's no, no um, ridges, no, no separation in there. So it meant that this aircraft could carry an array of, of weaponry and uh, different size bombs, which gave it, you know, unbelievable flexibility. And, uh, and it, combined with its range, speed, operating altitude, it made it the ideal choice for, um, for the chastise raid as well. So the Lancasters that were used on the Dambusters raid were basically um, Lancaster B1s, but with different engines. So rather than having the um, British made Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, they used the American Packard. So that denoted that they were B3s. But they are, you, you'll see that they've, they're denoted as being specials. You could argue that they should have been called um, 464 provisioning Lancasters because that was the technology behind the, the work to create the, the bouncing bomb release mechanism. Um, so that was installed here, but to, in order to do that, they would have to remove these, um, these bomb bay and they, they, they need to um, adapt the bomb bay to carry this, uh, this huge, technically advanced um, mine, which was like a huge cylindrical, like, like, a, like a big oil drum, realistically but it had to spin in reverse at about 500 uh, revs per minute. And, um, and it had to be released at the right height and, uh, and at the right speed in order to have the, the right impact. So with the reverse of the, of the spinning mine, it would skip along the water. And the important thing about that is that um, the Germans knew that the dams were a target. So they had um, anti-submarine nets right at the front to stop anything that way. So th this weapon actually um, bounced over those which was um, they, they'd never thought about that so uh, so so all the the work to put the the provisioning um, technology was was done there designed by Barnes Wallace and the, the Vickers team and uh, installed in um, associated with the with, with the Avro team who they must have worked really closely with and and uh, 23 of these aircraft were modified for, for that purpose um, and as we all now know 19 of them actually took part in the Dambusters raid. The first 19 Lancasters took off from RAF Scampton at 9.28 on the 16th of May, with the squadron suffering its first casualties soon after. While flying over the Dutch coast, one plane was shot down, while another struck an electricity pylon and crashed. In May, we also launched a second year of the Airflix Aviation Photo Awards. June saw the release of our second commemorative coin, a hair standing moment forever etched in time. Also in June, we announced our partnership with Visit Blackpool. We supported the new installation of the incredible tribute to one of the world's most iconic fighter aircraft, the Spitfire. The new look Spitfire Island was unveiled on Friday the 1st of September at the beginning of illumination season. And it will light up every night until the 1st of January 2024, so if you haven't seen it yet, why not pop over to Blackpool and check out the illumination. Now it was well and truly a year of surprise releases and in July this year we got the surprises started with the announcement of the Supermarine Seafire re-release.
Speaking of surprise announcements, how could we leave out the Sea King surprise announcement? July also saw the release of a vintage favourite, the Bonberg Vintage Classic Kit. There's a fascinating blog post on our website about how design manager Matt had to reverse engineer the clear parts for the re-release. We kicked off August with our third coin in our collection, the AFX Club Collector's Coin. August also saw the release of one of the favourites from this year, the Ferret Scout Car. In September, we have the privilege of being visited by the judge of Airfix Aviation Photography Awards, Darren Harbour. 
Hi, I'm Darren Harbour and I've been a professional aviation photographer at Miron for 25 years now. When I first got into aviation photography, I was a small child going to air shows with my father, so probably around the age of six, seven years old when I first started taking pictures and then progressed uh, into my teen years onto a more serious camera and uh, it went from there. Okay. There are some where the, the hair on my, my neck stands on end because it's exciting uh, and uh, they're the ones which are kind of real pinch me moments such as the ME262 and the Spitfire earlier this year. Um, the ones which make my hair stand on end are probably ones I wouldn't mention. So when it came to being involved in the um, Aviation Photography Awards for Airfix this year, it's quite an exciting opportunity. Uh, I met up with uh, the Airfix team by chance at Goodwood, um, where we were doing a night photography day. And um, conversations kind of came up uh, about me wishing to kind of be involved in the brand Airfix, because as a, a boyhood brand, which I grew up with, I was very keen to maybe do more with the brand. And uh, um, the team suggested um, maybe getting involved in the photographic competition, and the conversations progressed. And uh, now I've got the exciting opportunity of actually judging uh, this year's competition, which I'm actually really looking forward to. I think when you're a judge and you're looking for things which are um, going to stand out, it's the people that think differently. It's people that show that they've not necessarily just copied what other people have done previously. So it's not looking at back extreme types of photography, it's looking about people that have really thought about, does this picture tell a story? And that's the important thing. Do I look at this picture and want to know more? Do I think, how has it taken? Why has it been taken? What's the story behind it? If it's just a picture of an aeroplane against a blue sky, it doesn't really work. Whereas it's got some character involved, if it's got something which really tells a bit about where it's taken, those things are interesting. I think when it comes to sharing tips with people is that the key is really just think carefully about what you're going to take is the number one thing. So it doesn't matter if you're taking it on a mobile phone, it doesn't matter if you're taking it on a professional camera, anything will enable you to take a good photograph. So on a mobile phone you're perfectly capable of taking some very interesting pictures. Just look for things which maybe stand out as a bit different. Look for colour, look for shape, look for the composition. Make sure that the composition has got lots going on so that your eyes led around the picture. There's nothing more frustrating than having something in a picture that shouldn't be in a picture, so make sure there's no flagpoles going out the top of an aeroplane, for example. No feet at the bottom of an aeroplane while someone stood behind it. So think about what you'll do your picture. And I always use the phrase when I do training days, is look around your picture, don't just look at it. Also in September, we hit you with the surprise announcement of the 172nd scale Avro Vulcan Black Buck paired with the limited edition collector's coin. A week later we surprised you again with the surprise announcement of the SRN1 Hovercraft Vintage Classic Kit. Into October now and ferret designer Ethan gave us an insight into the design process of the ferret scout car. Yes, this is my first project for Airfix, it's a great one to get to begin with, loads of people love this sort of thing. Having to get used to the CAD software, learning all of that, developing throughout the process was a great thing to be able to do. Really happy with how it's come out in the end. Um, as I say, nothing better to start off with. So most projects sort of begin anywhere from five years out to, to three years out before the designer's even looking at a project. But the ferret's a bit different in that uh, it came from a suggestion uh, from a volunteer at Bovington. And then it was a, well, if no one's done this ferret, we started looking around, expecting oh, it must have been done. All these suggestions uh, are normally based on, oh, that manufacturer doesn't do it too well, or that one is a bit old. No one had done them in mainstream plastic injection moulding, which we couldn't believe. Um, so we thought we've got to jump at the chance. So we were pretty much straight into researching it. Uh, and luckily we had a designer starting not too far in the future, and that was Ethan. Um, so we thought, right, that's the perfect first project. It's a bit simpler than an aircraft. Um, well, that's what we thought at the time. Uh, ask Ethan about the suspension, it's not quite as simple as we thought. Um, but it, it just, all the stars aligned to get this project going really quickly. Uh, and it took 
about a year um, from, from ideation through to design being done and getting it to release, which is extremely quick. Uh, if you look at the 24 scale Spitfire, that was planned for um, probably three or four years from, from the previous 24 scale kit. So uh, the ferret is quite unique in that way. So I've had a background uh, working within toy industry before. Um, I've been doing product design since uh, school, uni, followed that through after that into a couple of separate jobs. Worked in lighting and then worked at Lego doing model kits. Um, and then came here once uni was finished. Um, I've always had an interest in model kits, uh, so it's really the perfect fit. Yeah, it's one of those things, obviously you start a new job and everyone's saying, oh, what are you up to? What are you, uh, what are you doing? Um, and the most I can say is, oh, I'm designing something for Airfix, really. Um, and as I say, it's been quite a long time. I've been here about a year and a half now, and it's only really now in the last few months that I've been able to talk about it. And as I say, see people start building and like painting the kits. Um, so a long process, but it's worth holding the secret when you get to see everyone's reactions. So the ferret hadn't been done as a mainstream injection molded kit uh, ever, as far as we can tell. Uh, there have been other manufacturers that had done them, but at different price points to where FX positions itself. So it was a, a gap in the market, essentially. Um, and the ferret is just so special. And it's not something we realized at the time, but the amount of people that have a link to ferrets, um, the vehicle, not the animal, uh, is extraordinary. You come across people, whenever you're showing them off the models at shows, uh, they say, oh, my dad drove that, I own one, or, you know, the cat next door has one, all that sort of stuff, which we didn't realise. And, and ever since we've announced we were doing the ferret, there's been a real outpouring of support, uh, which has been fantastic. Uh, it means that we get to drive them, which is a, a small perk of the job. Uh, I suppose, really, they're, they're more accessible than your average Spitfire. Uh, ferrets are generally considered the more affordable of the military vehicles that private individuals can own and that's why they're so popular uh, and we just love them they're nifty little things you know you can run around in them you go any military show and you'll see them uh, and there's something special about having that connection uh, you know not having to go to a museum where it's still quite static seeing them run around arenas and, and uh, really show off what they're meant to do is fantastic personal highlights of the project uh, are probably meeting Brian who owns the ferrets Ferret behind me and the ones around me at the moment, uh, a fantastic chap that just could never help you enough, uh, which is really nice. Getting to, to know Ethan, uh, as I say, it was his first ever project, um, so working together on that one was great. But in terms of the actual model, um, it was a real challenge from a research perspective, which is what we like. Uh, you know, different regiments, battalions would bolt various things onto the ferret, so trying to standardise that as much as possible and still be able to put out interesting schemes onto it uh, accurately was, was a real challenge. Uh, and, and that was just fantastic for me. Uh, it meant that I got really into the meat of the project quite quickly. Uh, and picking the schemes is always fun. So uh, that's probably the highlight for me, I'd say, is, is the unique schemes that we've managed to put on the box. Also in October, I had a rather scary incident with the Land Rover starter set. Well, Halloween is here, and as I've done for Christmas, I thought I'd do a seasonal build. This time I thought I'd try out the new Land Rover starter set. Of course, as always, I should preface this by saying I'm not much of a modeler, but I'm very keen to learn and take on any advice you'd like to leave in the comments for me. The design I settled on was an orange Land Rover sat on a pumpkin patch diorama. I started off with a primer coat and a spray of orange paint. I then moved on to the diorama and I'd handily have found a base from a local hobby store. And of course, by being in the same building as Hornby, I had all the resources I needed. I also purchased these Halloween style decals to go on the Land Rover to add a little bit of decoration. And this is the final thing. Overall I'm pretty happy, I really enjoyed building the diorama and hopefully that's something I could do more of in the future. Now you're probably after some more angles of this beautiful build, but I have some bad news. I turned my back for a second and it hit the floor and it smashed into pieces. I have to take that as a lesson learned when building a spooky build, make sure you expect some paranormal intervention. Although the car has seen better days, I really, really enjoyed this Halloween challenge. And when you thought we were all done, in November, another surprise announcement. We announced the ME410 with a special Sprue Talk episode.
Hello everyone and welcome to Sprue Talk. So as Dale likes to say, the cat is out of the bag. The Messerschmitt ME410 is our surprise announcement and we keep giving you these cheeky little surprises. Today I've got with me the positive, the ever beautiful ever be Luke, beautiful. our researcher. Thank you. You're a bit of a regular now here on the show. I am, yeah. I keep trying to get away but yeah. you keep pulling me back in. <laughs> and the enigma, the Matt Wise. Our sign uh, manager, welcome to Spree Talk. You've been on a couple of times. Yeah, I've been on uh, the Q&A sessions nice. and I, I've also been on talking about the Avro Anson. Brilliant. Well, today we are going to be talking about the Messerschmitt uh, ME410. Uh, as I said, it's one of our um, uh, quite a few surprises that we've had this year. Sea King, Sea Fire, Hovercraft, mm, yeah. uh, which have all gone down really well. Uh, and as we speak here today, future you will both be at Telford this weekend. Uh, talking to everyone about this along with all of our other range. Um, so we know by now how the kind of process works. We've picked our product. It comes to, to you, Luke, for research. Mm. So what what was the starting point for you with, with, with this one? Um, so the idea of 410 was already around when I joined the business, okay. um, probably two and a half, maybe a bit more years ago now. Um, so ME410 was sort of already on the cards and, and the first I sort of knew about it was um, we went on the trip to Cosford mm -hmm. it's obviously the only 410 that's currently on display there's only, so, only one other in the whole of the world and that's mm -hmm. out in the US but that's currently stored awaiting restoration so it's the only one it's about eight miles from where we are today right. talking <laughs> Telford um, so we myself and my predecessor Simon uh, yep. went up to Cosford to 3D scan the aircraft um, obviously there's not much choice in which aircraft we scan so you know, we went there um, and took loads of photos. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I hadn't been involved with the business for long, uh, so I couldn't say to Matt, do you want to come along? Because it's going to be your product. So uh, I don't think, Matt, you, you didn't get to see the 410 during the visit, did you? No, but thankfully, we, um, one of the other designers did manage to get out there, um, took hundreds of photos, so we had a really solid base of information to work from. Yes. It's one of those where you, you start looking at an aircraft that's been in the museum for a long time, um, and there, there are the normal pitfalls. One of the, the more obvious ones with the Messerschmitt 410 at Cosford is that the propellers are not rounded, as you see on the models. They are cropped. And that's because, uh, as far as uh, we've been told, they were run when at St. Athen, and one of them was damaged. And to, to sort of balance them, they cropped off the ends of all the others. Mm. So if, you do, if, you, you know, if you're not reading, uh, it's quite easy to make a big faux pas with that one. <laughs> um, so we, we, we researched that. And one of the problems with 410 is that uh, there's not a whole load of published works around the, the aircraft. Um, so you're, you're really reliant on your primary data, so your scan of, of the aircraft, mm -hmm. talking to experts where you can find them. Um, you know, a lot of people are into the Luftwaffe. When you're down into the 210 and the 410, it's a bit more niche. Mm -hmm. So finding people that knew a lot about that was quite difficult. Um, and then obviously using your period images and um, sort of, again, primary sources, not relying on what's written in the books because, as we've discussed before, uh, no, there might be five different authors and they all say the same thing. doesn't mean it's true because yeah, they've all copied yeah. each other over the years. <laughs> so uh, uh, it sort of started off with that scan. That's where we, we sort of began nice. the, the, the product life cycle. And before November was over, the fairy gannet reached your modelling bench. Now into the final month of the year, and this month we've been getting some of the Airfix team to partake in the Quick Build Challenge. Hello Airfix fans and welcome to a Quick Build Challenge. I'm joined by Ethan. Hello. How are you doing Ethan? Pretty good. Yeah. Joined by Adam. Hi. How are you doing Adam? Good. It's his big league debut today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he is buzzing to be on camera, isn't he? Uh, all week, all week. So are you, are you familiar with the Quick Build Challenge rules? No. No? no? Okay. Well. <laughs> I'm going to give you a quick build kit, and you have to build it within 15 minutes, no instructions, and we're not going to give you the box either. Does it have to be right? 
I'd prefer if it was. <laughs> right, yeah. How does that sound? Sounds good to yeah? me. Oh yeah. I yeah, I think I've got more to lose here. So yeah. Yeah, well, it's a yeah. quick bird of fish in the harbour. You've yeah. got pride. Well, do you want to tell them a little bit more about you, Adam? Because you've not been on camera before. Oh so. no, yeah. Uh, so I'm a quick build designer. So. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave. Um, so this might be disastrous for me. So I've got more to lose here. So it should be fun. So yeah. when you design them, do you build them? You yeah, must build them yeah, before. I build them, but. Depending on what it is, I probably might have not built this for many years now. Oh, God. In, like, four years. So. So, so yeah, that's a good point. I haven't yeah. told you what you're building, no. and you've been pestering me all week. What are we building? What do you reckon we're building? A quick build kit. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty strong guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good guess. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna say tax. I was gonna say boss. Yeah. Are you ready for me to reveal it? It's under. It's under the table. It's mm. under the table. Victor. You ready? Oh. oh my god, one nil to me away. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm already in his head. So, have you built this one before? Uh, I've never built this. He has built at least 20 of them. Yeah. And you presumably you built them without instructions as well. Yeah, well, I designed he's this one, so. <laughs> and he always does it by the quick build challenge he's, rolls. He's got a real advantage here, I'm not going to lie to you. So, why don't we open them up and we'll throw away the box and all the, all the stuff in it? I uh, do you have some Christmas trivia. Okay. You can either work together or you can work against each other. The answer on the sheet, so please don't look at work. Okay. Paper. Um, but they're pretty quick fire, so okay. feel free to, to okay. rattle them off. This one's quite tricky, actually. I'm not sure I would have got this one. But if you were born on Christmas Day, uh -huh. what is your star sign? Oh. Oh, I don't know, actually. I have no idea apart from my own. I just, yeah, I just know yeah. the <laughs> people that I like. And is no one I know is born on Christmas, so... Have a guess. What is after Scorpius? Aquarius is January. That's yeah, that's good. January. And Scorpius is November. Yes. In between? We guess... Uh, cancer? No, Cancer is June. Okay. Capricorn? It is Capricorn. Oh, nice! <laughs> well done. I don't think I know any Capricorns. You must know San Nicholas. He's a Capricorn, surely? Sam. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're like, who's that? <laughs> also this month, me and some of the team have been taking part in another starter set challenge. Over the first 12 days of December, you would have been able to see my progress with daily videos on our social media channels and here at YouTube. Here's the final build and two more done by the video team here at Hornby. Which one is your favourite? Let me know in the comments down below. Well, that concludes our 2023 look back. Of course, that wasn't even close to everything Airfix got up to this year, so comment down below your favourite moment of this year. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in January for our 2024 range announcement. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.